Ursus Catacea, Sierra Fury, D-Man Gamez, and Brian Sullivan all responded very positively when I suggested during the Therizinosaurus episode that I should do a whole episode about feathers and their origins. And that ties really nicely into last episode, which was Deinonychus, because Deinonychus was feathered, but in order to reach that conclusion, there's a lot of dinosaur science we have to do, and we're going to talk about it. Feathers were, still are to a large extent, the diagnostic trait of birds. If, if you have an animal with feathers, we reasonably conclude that it is a bird or very closely related to birds. It was in the 1860s, shortly after The Origin of Species was published, that Archaeopteryx was found. This was, still is, really, the first bird. It, it, it had clear feather trace impressions, but also had clear dinosaurian traits, what we would now call dinosaurian traits, but at the time was reptilian traits. For that reason, even though some authors actually did make the connection between what we now call Silurosaurian theropods and birds, that theory fell out of favor for the better part of a hundred years until John Ulstrom and his Deinonychus show up and he resurrects that uh, 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 link and now it's almost universally accepted that birds are nested deeply within the, the clay dinosauria. It was after that link was resurrected that we first started to see restorations of the Manoraptorans specifically and, and Silurosaurians more generally with feathers or feather-like structures on them. But at that stage, it was all, it was entirely speculative. That's why the restorations that you see from Bakker or from, from Greg Paul are not consistent with what we now know about feathers because they, they it really was a fringe theory up until the mid 90s when the, the Liaoning province in China uh, started producing all of these hundreds of fossils that we have had out of there of, of dinosaurs and early birds from the late Jurassic to the, the Cretaceous with feather traces and, and what we call proto-feather traces. And it is the work of Xiu Xing, for, for, uh, who's, uh, uh, him and his co-authors wrote uh, uh, quite a bit about feather evolution and, and it is from their work primarily that I, I am drawing the content of this episode. We have a much, much clearer idea of how feathers came about, but the corollary to that is that a lot of dinosaurs that would previously have been restored with scaly skin are now shown with either true feathers or what's called proto-feathers, a sort of fluff. Going forward, an important thing to keep in mind, evolution does not have goals. When we want to analyze why a trait emerged, we can't look at what its ultimate function was. In other words, we can't look at birds which use their feathers to fly and assume that the initial purpose of feathers was flight. In fact, Somewhat counterintuitively, the initial purpose of feathers had nothing whatsoever to do with flight, as far as we can figure. That said, we can learn quite a bit from looking at modern birds and how they use their feathers because perhaps one of the more esoteric or perhaps more mundane functions is what dinosaurs needed them for. The first and perhaps most obvious use for feathers is locomotion. The birds use it to push air around, not just for flying though. They'll also use it to streamline their body for moving through air or water. They'll use it uh, when running. We, we talked about wing-assisted inclined running during Deinonychus episode, but also just when running along the ground. It, it helps with balance to have wings. It's used in thermal regulation uh, to keep the animal warm and to an extent to keep the animal cool. Uh, uh, and also, uh, not just for the creature itself, but for its offspring. It, uh, many birds brood their eggs and use their feathers to insulate their offspring, which is a direct selective advantage. Birds also use their feathers for display purposes. Uh, coloration plays a role in camouflaging the animal. It's used in courtship displays. Regarding the anatomy of modern feathers, there are a bunch of types for specific purposes on the bird, but 
For our purposes, we're gonna define contour feathers and downy feathers, which are sometimes called pinaceous and plumulaceous feathers respectively, but I'm going to say contour and downy because those are easier to say without messing up. All feathers are composed of the same material. They're made of keratin, the same thing that your nails are made of, the same thing that an alligator's scales are made out of, which will be important later. They're effectively filaments that bind together into various useful structures. The simplest feather that we have today is down, which is just a bunch of separate filaments coming out of a follicle embedded in the skin. The most complex feather we have is the contour feather, which is sometimes called a flight feather if it's extremely asymmetrical. The, the tail feathers on a bird are, are almost symmetrical, whereas the flight feathers on the wings, the, the primaries, are, are heavily asymmetrical. That starts with a follicle embedded in the skin, going up into a bunch of fused together filaments, forming a colimus, which leads up into a rachis. The barbs coming off of that calamus and rachis uh, form first a fluffy after feather, and then on either side of the feather, veins made out of barbs, which themselves have barbs, which are called barbules, which have these little hooks on them so that they interlock with one another and, and, and form a more or less rigid vein. The evolutionary timeline of how we got to contour feathers is rather incomplete. We have inferred the stages that it needed to go through, but for one thing, most of the specimens we're working from are as recent or more recent as the, the, the fully developed contour feathers that you see in Archaeopteryx. So we know we have contour feathers by the late Jurassic, and we just have to project backwards from there to infer the steps that were needed to get there. The first stage was a simple filament rising from the skin. It, it was a hair-like bristle or, or sometimes a longer quill. I say quill, but quill specifically refers to the derived structure of having a bunch of barbs fused together, whereas this really was just one barb. This is the integument that we see on Sinosauropteryx. And it's the one that we infer for quite a large swath of the Silurosaurians. The second stage was a bunch of filaments with barb ridges on them. They weren't true barbs. It, it looks like if you have barbs, you have to also have barbules. There's, there's a fractal thing that happens with the genes but these would not have had the, the hooks necessary or the complicated structures necessary to produce veins. They were, they were really just ridges. But what we did see, because you have barbs, you have follicles, which means you can have multiple filaments join basally in this parallel arrangement. So it, it's almost like down that we see today. This is not to say that dinosaurs that would have been covered in this would have been fluffy ducklings. That would be cute, but that is not necessarily the case. The third stage is the development of the rachis, which as I mentioned earlier, is fused from filaments. So you have barbs joining together in the middle as, as the feather forms. And this produces shapes that are either a dandelion seed sort of shape or a pine branch sort of shape. And we know that it's fused barbs both because we look at the development of feathers in living birds and because we have fossilized feathers from the Cretaceous in Europe. Uh, they're actually encased in amber that have partially fused barbs forming a rachis. Once you have a rachis forming, it's not a large step, evolutionarily speaking, to get planar form, which is instead of the barbs sticking out from the rachis every which way, they're sticking out on either side. This produces a bilaterally symmetrical feather. Basically, when the feather is forming, instead of fusing in a sort of tubular fashion, they fuse together on one side and, and you wind up with a, a, essentially a modern semi-plume. Stage five shows us hooked barbules. We have true veins now. This is pretty similar to a body feather on a modern bird. 
this is where we start to see feather tracts emerging uh, on the limbs of dinosaurs and on the bodies of aves. Feather tracts being the regular pattern that feathers grow in on the body. When we hit stage six, we have true anatomically modern, more or less, contour feathers. We have asymmetrical veins with, with a, a curved rachis. Leading edge is slightly rigid and, and narrower, whereas the trailing edge is more flexible. This allows the feather to pass through the air. It allows the feather to interact with other feathers to form an airfoil, uh, to form a wing or a tail. Or in the case of Microraptor, it can form these weird leg wings. In fact, we found that the flight feathers occurring on the feet of the animal is basal to birds as well. Which is strange because we're not 100% sure what the purpose of that was. It might just be an artifact. Like, we know that the large feathers form at the tips of the limbs, at the extremities of the, the hands, the feet, and the tail first. So perhaps it was a happy accident that they had feathered feet for a while. This happens the other way too. When we look at the emergence of feathers, we can say with confidence that it wasn't for flight because in order to develop feathers to start flying, that's a lot of changes. Whereas like when, when pterosaurs had to fly or when bats had to fly, it was a much smaller change just to develop fleshy membranes. And I realized that pterosaur and bats membranes are completely different structures and there's a lot of difference there, but I'm simplifying here. Birds were able to use feathers to fly because they already had feathers. The direct evidence of feathers is pretty scant, relatively speaking. In order for soft tissue like feathers to fossilize, you have to have the animal buried really quickly in very fine particulate. And it has to remain undisturbed for the ensuing hundred million years. Liaoning is one such place. The rock is so fine, actually, that if we look at the, the trace fossil of the feather under an electron microscope, we see trace fossils of organelles, specifically melanosomes. Those are the organelles in your cells that give you your hair, eye, and skin color. But they also give other animals their color, notably birds. What's kind of cool is that based on the shape of those melanosomes, we can take a really good guess at what some of these animals would have had for color. For instance, in Microraptor, we know that it would have had iridescence. The, the sheen that you see on, on crows, for instance. And we know that Anchiornis, we, we have a complete color scheme for Anchiornis. We know that it has a gray body with, with a red head and, and black and white wingtips. And that's really cool. That color was one of those things that when I was a kid, it was like, oh no, we'll never figure out what color dinosaurs were. It'll always be an educated guess. And no, because microscopes. If the animal is sufficiently derived that it has true calamus and, and quills holding up its feathers, on its forearms, it will have, on its ulna specifically, it'll have quill knobs. It'll, it'll have marks where the uh, feather originally attached in life. We have those for Velociraptor, which is a good indication that the very closely related Deinonychus would have had feathers as well. The other main area of direct evidence we have is actually living relatives of dinosaurs. You probably know that at some point in your life, very early in your life, you had gills and a tail. Well, the same is true for birds when they develop in the egg. We, we can look at them and look at how their feathers develop and get a sort of an idea of how feathers might have arisen originally. More importantly, we can do biochemical studies on crocodile scales and on bird feathers, and we've determined that they are genetically homologous, which is to say the same programming produces 
crocodile scoots as produces a bird's feathers. So it's not too out there to suppose that feathers might be a basal, that is a primitive, we're not supposed to use the word primitive anymore though, trait of all archosaurs. Archosaurs? Archosaurs. That statement was an example of phylogenetic bracketing. And that's the primary method we use to say whether a creature would have had feathers or not. It's the primary way we determine a lot of dinosaur anatomy considering the fragmentary nature of our remains. Cladistics is a deep topic and I will probably do a whole episode on it at some point. What bracketing is, is when we take a trait that is unknown in one creature but known for related creatures, we can say with some confidence that if, if two descendants of a common ancestor both have a trait, that common ancestor probably had that trait, unless we have evidence that it didn't. Because that common ancestor had that trait, all of its descendants had that trait as their default state, as their primitive condition. For Solurosauria, protofeathers, those simple filaments of, of stage one that we, that we talked about, seem to be the primitive condition. We have Euteranus from China has been discovered. It's a pretty big Solurosaur. Pretty big in this case, meaning it was only a ton and a half. And it still had feathers, and there's a common belief that large animals would not need the full body covering in order to keep warm. But here's you, Tyrannus. And from that, we can project that perhaps all of the Tyrannosaurs were feathered. That's why you start to see Tyrannosaurus rex restored with feathers. We know that once you get into the Manoraptorans, the closer you get to birds, the more derived feathers you start to see. The Oviraptors, the, the Troodontids, and, the, and especially the Dromaeosaurs have quite advanced feather structures. And that's why when we look at Deinonychus, we can say pretty confidently that it had the full tail fan and the pinaceous feathers on its arms, which I want to call wings because that's what they looked like. Going back even further though, we have filament structures on completely the opposite side of the dinosaur family tree. I've been talking about theropods, which are, are Sauruskians, but the Ornithischians, Stachosaurus and Tianyulong, both have these filaments, these, these really rather rigid tubular structures arising from their backs. And they're very different at first glance from what we see in the theropods, so there's a school of thought that they aren't actually homologous structures, or if they are, they arose separately, which could be the case if it weren't for a little dinosaur from Siberia called Colindrodromaeus, which has both stage one fe protofeathers, which are the filaments, and stage three, uh, 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 and these sort of ribbon-like filamentous structures that, that we haven't really seen anywhere else. There, there's a few other sort of evolutionary dead ends that, that we have as far as protofeathers go in dinosaurs that I haven't mentioned because they weren't on the, the sort of main sequence to, to get to contour feathers. But we do see a lot of really strange structures uh, uh, that we figure can only have been for display arising in, in a few dinosaurs. But Kalindodromaeus has this not entirely full body covering, its tail was mostly naked for starters, as were its feet and hands and most of its face. But this implies that protofeathers might be basal to the dinosauria. Or if you look at the structures that are on pterosaurs, like I mentioned in the Pteranodon episode, they have pinka fibers covering their bodies. Those might be homologous with the protofeathers of dinosaurs, which would push it all the way back to Ornithodira, assuming that you classify pterosaurs as Ornithodirans. Because in science, we have to assume that the simplest answer that fits the data must be the case, we can only conclude that Deinonychus had feathers until we get evidence that it did not. What I'm trying to get at with all of this is that even though there are so many unknowns with 
how feathers came to be and exactly which dinosaurs would have had them. Especially for the most popular dinosaurs, which are the Silurosaurs, your, your Tyrannosaurus and your Velociraptor, we know beyond any reasonable doubt that they had feathers. And the reason that we devoted a whole episode to this is that there's a trend in popular culture that is disturbing to me, and, and, and Mark Witten calls it feather resistance, and I think that's a good term. It's this idea that dinosaurs look dumb or silly or, or not scary anymore, or not dangerous or, or badass anymore when you put them in feathers. It's like we prefer the, the fantastic, the, the ancient real-life dragon interpretation of dinosaurs to the flesh-and-blood real creatures that once walked the earth that we know tantalizing little about version of dinosaurs. I recognize that dinosaurs can only ever really come to life in your imagination, so it makes sense to cherish and try to protect your conception of them. But they weren't movie monsters, they were real creatures, and the purpose of this show, really, is not about the toys. It's about trying to pull people out of that pop culture bubble where everything they learn about dinosaurs is, is facts. Dinosaur science is inherently guesswork. It, it's inductive reasoning much more than deductive reasoning. So there's an excitement to that. There's there's a romanticism in reconstructing a past that we will never completely understand, but that's always changing and there's always new stuff to learn. And I know that feathers looked dumb for a while there because paleo artists might not have had a good idea of what they were doing, but if you look at the work of Emily Willoughby and John Conway, really everyone that was involved with the All Yesterdays project, feathered dinosaurs are so cool looking. Please don't let your prejudices get in the way of you learning things. This has been Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong. Please remember to like, comment, subscribe, share, comment with dinosaurs you'd like me to have on the show. You could even send me a toy dinosaur. Our address is in the description. Please go to thegeekgroup.org to find out how you can become a member. You can get involved in other ways. You could donate. You could visit our online store. Uh, we are open to the public. Come visit us in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And we'll see you next time. This video was made possible by a grant from the Future Girl Foundation. This video was made possible by thousands of private donations from members and viewers like you. Please visit thegeekgroup.org for more information on how you can donate and become a part of our dreams of Avalon.